Good afternoon. As a starting point, I'd like to quote a sentence from the 52nd chapter of the Rule of St. Benedict. If it happens that a brother wishes to pray quietly by himself, let him simply enter and pray. As often happens, there is much in this brief sentence that is worth pondering if we care to take the trouble. It takes for granted that the starting point of prayer is internal, the work of grace, the result of the Spirit's interior action. Within the context of a person's life, a thought, a wish, a desire manifests itself, a desire to make conscious contact with God. It's not something that we ourselves manufacture, perhaps at the behest of the superego or in response to some external prompting. It rises spontaneously to the surface of consciousness. This desire is implanted in us by our creation in God's image and likeness as by our incorporation in, into Christ through baptism. The desire to unite ourselves to God pre-exists our awareness of it. We exist, as it were, in a state of prayer, but for the most part, it is in sleep mode. There we carry on with other activities. We're not angels. There are many things that we must do in order to survive and thrive. Eating, sleeping, relating, working. These activities are not without value. They have their own inherent dignity. But from time to time, in loose moments, when we are not constrained by other involvements, we may become conscious of a call to prayer. Not one that sounds externally like the Muesin's call, but one that comes from the very deep depths of our being, from deep within our hearts. At first, the call seems very faint because we lack the spiritual sensitivity to perceive it. But if we slowly develop the habit of paying attention, it becomes clearer and in time may sometimes begin to be a little intrusive. It's a call to turn aside from whatever we are doing, from our work, from our entertainment, from our anxieties, and lift up our hearts to God, to enter into that inner chamber where we make contact with a mysterious presence. Sometimes this floating sense of God's presence happily coexists with whatever else we are doing, imparting a vertical aspect to the mundane task in which we are involved. In the beginning, we do not quite know how to respond to these intimations of immortality, as William Wordsworth termed them. We are, we are momentarily touched by a word, or by beauty in nature or in art, or through some other medium, and there is a strong inner response, a kind of echo, or as we find in the cloud of unknowing, a stirring. Something deep within us wakes up. We find ourselves attracted, drawn to the invisible realm of spirit without being able to explain why. If we have never had any religious instruction, we are a little bewildered by what we experience and even a little fearful. What does it mean? Here we have to make the point 
that spiritual experience such as we encounter in the sense of being called to prayer will not yield its meaning to rational analysis or investigation. It is more at the level of intuition, a sudden glow of insight that is not attached to anything around it, something that is more an affair of the right hemisphere of the brain than of the rational left. It's a feeling that is deeper than ordinary feelings, because it does not trace its origin to anything outside ourselves, although it may be triggered by some external encounter or event. If we term it mysterious, this does not mean that it is unreal. It means that it is outside the usual dynamism of cause and effect that we employ to make sense of the world around us. Think of the story of Moses and the burning bush in the third chapter of the book of Exodus. Detached from familiar surroundings, Moses sees something extraordinary and is drawn to investigate. Though he feels a certain sense of awe and trepidation in approaching the mystery, and he allows himself to follow the attraction and is brought into the presence of God. Overwhelmed with reverence, he is compelled to remove his shoes as a sign that he has entered the sphere of the sacred. The God whom he encounters cannot be named, cannot be contained within human categories. This God simply is. No further characterization is necessary or possible. I am who I am. Moses meets the living God and his life is forever changed. Our experience of catching a glimpse of the reality of the spiritual world may be less dramatic and less overpowering, but it follows a similar sequence. Invitation, response, encounter, mission. Our life begins to take a different course, usually not on the basis of a single occasion, but through a succession of cumulative moments, and not without resistance and rebellion on our part, God comes more fully into our lives. So the beginning of prayer is this felt glimmer of grace that shoots a thought into our minds. There it can evaporate if we've never been initiated into the practice of prayer. If we have some experience in prayer, we can, within the confines of our everyday existence, make some kind of transition lifting up our hearts, turning our eyes to God, giving ourselves a breathing space to make contact with the invisible reality of the spiritual world. And so the question arises, where, what form does this turning to God take? Where can I find a teacher of prayer? St. John Climacus in the 7th century gives us the answer. Have all courage and you will have God for your teacher in prayer. He goes on to say that nobody else can teach us to pray, no more than anyone can teach us to see. All others can do for us is to instruct us to open our eyes. It's my firm belief that if we place ourselves in God's hands, then God will lead us along the paths of prayer until, after many years, we unselfconsciously attain the heights. 
The monastic tradition has always been cool about techniques of prayer. Thomas Merton, for example, wrote much about contemplation, but never endorsed a particular method of moving in that direction. People used to write to him asking, how do you get contemplation? As if it were a product that could be purchased, or a step-by-step method that could be followed. Deep prayer is always the effect of grace. It's not something that we can acquire or learn or achieve. Yes, there are techniques for quietening the emotions and emptying the mind of intrusive thoughts. In some cases, these can serve as preliminaries to prayer, even necessary preliminaries. But prayer itself is something different. Perhaps a good way to envisage prayer is to see it as taking place at the intersection of our faith with the reality of our daily life. The beginning of prayer is faith, not so much an act of belief on our part, but the gift of the theological virtue of faith, which, flanked by hope and charity, unites us to God. We don't have to knock on the gates of heaven. We are already inside. We have been made sharers in the divine nature, no longer foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints, members of the household of God. By the working of the Holy Spirit, we are able to be bold and address God by the family name, Abba. And so we don't have to pursue prayer. We already have it. All we have to do is to wake up and stir into flame the gifts that God has already given us. Do you remember the text from the book of Deuteronomy? The commandment that I give you this day is not difficult nor is it beyond your reach. It is not up in the sky that you should say, who will go up into the sky for us and fetch it for us so that we may hear it and keep it. Nor is it across the sea that you should say, who will cross the seas for us and fetch it that we may hear it and keep it. No, the word is very near to you. It is on your lips and in your heart, ready to be kept. Perhaps you are familiar with the Sufi wise man Nasruddin, who used to instruct his disciples by doing stupid things. On one occasion, the disciples found Nasruddin on all fours, crawling about the marketplace in the dust and heat. And they asked him what he was doing. And he said, I lost my key and I'm looking for it. And they offered to help. So all of them crawled around the marketplace in the dust and the heat. Finally, when the whole area had been searched, the exasperated disciples asked, Are you sure you dropped it here? And he responded, Oh no, I dropped it somewhere in my house. And they exploded, Then why have we been looking for it here? And he smiled and said, You know my house, it's very dark. There is much more light out here. The point of the story is that sometimes we claim to be seeking something, but we don't look for it in the place where it's likely to be found. We exert ourselves looking for it in a place where we will never find. Maybe we enjoy the seeking, but ultimately the quest is hopeless. Where should we search for prayer? St John Chrysostom gives us the answer. Find the key of your heart 
and you will see that it also opens the gates of the kingdom of heaven. To enter into the realm of God, we must first enter into the heart. To go within the inner chamber, as Jesus said. The same point is made by the desert father Abba Pambo. When a disciple came to him and asked how he might be saved, he received the response, Find your heart and you will be saved. Thomas Merton lived a little later than the Desert Fathers, but his approach was similar, though expressed in more contemporary language. He made a distinction between the outer self and the deep self, or the false self and the true self. The outer self is the identity represented by our CV. Mostly it's given to us by others, just as our name was given to us by others. Or it can be our response to the expectations of others, our desire to please the various quasi-parental figures that emerge in the course of life. We want to become what others want us to be, so that we win their approval, affirmation and applause. But it is the deep self that is the site of prayer. It is the deep self that is redeemed. It's the spirit that gives life. The flesh profits nothing. This is how Merton expresses this fundamental truth. Unless we discover this deep self which is hidden with Christ in God, we will never really know ourselves as persons, nor will we know God. For it is by the doors of this deep self that we enter into the spiritual knowledge of God. It is by the doors of this deep self that we enter into the spiritual knowledge of God. The false self is, alas, the person that most of those around us know. They are familiar with the mask but never seek to understand what is behind it. It is this mask, this existential falsehood, that we present to the world that is the root of our alienation from God. We struggle to make contact with God because we are operating out of a superficial self-presentation that has no basis in reality. Listen to Merton again. All sin starts with the assumption that my false self, the self that exists only in my egocentric desires, is the fundamental reality of life to which everything else in the universe is ordered. Thus I use up my life and the desire for pleasures and the thirst for experiences, for power, honour, knowledge and love, to clothe this false self and construct its nothingness into something objectively real. And I wind experiences round myself and cover myself with pleasures and glory like bandages in order to make myself perceptible to myself and to the world, as if I were an invisible body that could only become visible when something visible covers its surface. Many of us confuse religion with morality. Now, there's nothing wrong with morality, but it is not the whole of human life. Mainly, this is because the morality that we envisage is a morality ab absorbed through socialization, from our parents, from our educators, from our social ambience. It's more like a code of conduct imposed externally. 
we conform to what is expected of us. But there is a deeper law, the law of conscience based on self-knowledge. Remember the advice of Polonius in Act I of Hamlet. This above all, to thine own self be true, and it must follow as the night the day, thou canst not then be false to any man. Authentic self-knowledge and integrity are the basis of all genuine morality. The transition we make into responsible adulthood is when we stop trying to be good and start trying to be ourselves, true to what we really are. It sounds easy, but most find it a gut-wrenching challenge. When we say that it is the true and deep self that is the springboard for our prayer, we're not envisaging some glamorous inner being that we would be happy to parade before an admiring audience. No, the true self is who we actually are, warts and all. Not the creation of imaginative public relations specialists, but ourselves without dressing up, without make-up, without pretense. Merton again. The inner self is not an ideal self, especially not an imaginary perfect creature fabricated to measure up to our compulsive need for greatness, heroism and infallibility. On the contrary, the real I is just simply our self, and nothing more, nothing more, nothing less. Ourself as we are in the eyes of God, to use Christian terms. Ourself in all our uniqueness, dignity, littleness, and ineffable greatness. Our real and homely self, and nothing more. Without glory, without self-aggrandizement, without self-righteousness, and without self-concern. The ground of all prayer is reality, our humdrum, imperfect, everyday reality. Our relationship with God is not like icing on a cake, flash icing that conceals a very mediocre product underneath. The basis of prayer is reality, what we are, who we are, now. You will remember that in the Gospels, Jesus frequently addresses the Pharisees as hypocrites. The word actually means play actors, people playing a role, putting on a performance. We don't often realise that it's important for us to be ourselves before God, to be naked and unashamed. As Abbot John Chapman of Downside in the 1930s wrote, pray as you are, don't pray as you aren't. This may mean beginning our prayer with the recognition of where we are, mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually. As we try to lift up our hearts to God, Lord, I'm really very angry. Lord, I have a headache. Lord, I really made a mess of things today. Lord, I would much rather be somewhere else. Honesty is the best policy. The reason that from time to time we have to change the mood or format of our prayer is simply because prayer results from the interaction of our faith with the reality of the present situation. St John Cashin in the early 5th century concluded that there are as many forms of prayer as there are states of soul. 
one size does not fit all. He wrote, Prayer is fashioned anew from moment to moment, according to the measure in which the mind is purified and according to the sort of situation in which it finds itself, whether this be the result of external contingency or its own doing. It is certain, moreover, that nobody is ever able to keep praying in the same way. Persons pray in one manner when they are cheerful, and in another when they are weighed down by sadness or a sense of hopelessness. When they are flourishing spiritually, their prayer is different from when they are oppressed by the extent of their struggles. They pray in one way when they are seeking pardon for their sins, and in another when they are asking for some grace or virtue or for the elimination of a particular vice. Sometimes prayer is conditioned by compunction, occasioned by the thought of hell and the fear of judgment. At other times it is aflame with hope and desire for the good things to come. Persons pray in one manner when they find themselves in dangerous straits and in another when they enjoy quiet and security. Prayer is sometimes illumined by the revelation of heavenly mysteries, but at other times one is forced to be content with the sterile practice of virtue and the experience of sterility. We might conclude from this that one of the greatest obstacles to prayer is the re attempt to repeat yesterday's prayer. Instead of allowing prayer to create itself out of the elements of today's situation. This may well lead us to the conclusion that perhaps we need to ask whether our understanding of prayer is appropriate for the real situation in which we find ourselves today. Are we praying from where we are or are we pretending to be somewhere else? As we have said, Prayer springs up at the intersection of faith and life. For this to happen, there has to be a certain looseness about our daily activities. If they are packed in tight, there is no room for anything beyond ourselves. Pope Francis has repeatedly warned us of the dangers of what he terms efficiency. We try to fill our lives with as much as possible, to finish one task quickly so as to pass on to another. Quality matters less than quantity. We've become addicts of multitasking. To do one thing at a time does not satisfy us. Like Martha, we like to be busy and concerned about many things simultaneously. So, if we want more prayer in our lives, we have to make space for it. It's not a question of finding time, we have to make time. We have to make gaps so that prayer can rise to the surface. The preparation for prayer is more a matter of subtraction than addition. Perhaps this might mean that we have to learn the virtue of inefficiency. You may have had the experience of walking along a street on which you normally drive. When you drive, you watch the traffic and have little time to see what is on the side of the road. When you walk, you slow down. You can observe what is around you you notice things that many times you have passed by unseen. In the 13th century, Marco Polo's journey from Venice to China took about four years. Today, we can fly the same route in less than 24 hours. But if you read the travels of Marco Polo, you will notice that on the ground, 
he saw much, much more than we do at 10,000 metres. The moral of the story is, come down to earth, take your time and you will be in touch with more of reality, including the workings of the spirit. Shoehorn less into your day and you will begin to live more mindfully. If we make space, prayer will become for us both the engine that energises and drives us forward and the guidance systems that keeps us from wandering off the track. But it is a prayer that is not of our own making, nor is it under our control. It cannot be persuaded to be anything other than what it is, the bridge between the concrete reality of our life and God. As St. John Climacus famously observed, your prayer will show in what condition you are. Theologians say that prayer is the monk's mirror. If when you attempt to pray you don't like what you see, it's no good buying a new mirror in the hope that you will appear in a better light. Prayer unsettles us sometimes because it's not fooled. It shows us as we are. It's useless giving up prayer or looking for a different prayer. We have to accept that what we find in prayer is a true picture of who we are. If you don't like it, then it's time to begin to change. If it happens that a brother or sister wishes to pray quietly by themselves, let them simply enter and pray. Make space for the Spirit to prompt and then follow the lead. The West will unfold as life proceeds. It's cool.